Open your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to look verses 1 through 6 together this morning. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Hence it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the privilege of sitting and hearing Your Word. Lord, you, Your Word is a precious gift. Lord, without Your Word, we wouldn't know You. We would not have the forgiveness of sins. Lord, thank You. And I pray now as we spend the next little while looking at it, listening to it, that You would grant us illumination to see what it is saying, to see its significance for our lives, and to be encouraged by it. Father, I pray that we would leave this place with a greater love for You than when we came in. I pray that we would hunger and thirst for You more as a result of spending this time in Your Word today. Please bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I don't know how old you have to be to have a midlife crisis. But sometimes I begin to wonder if perhaps that's what's happening to me. I mean, you, you have this feeling like I'm just not cool anymore. I mean, and part of it could be the fact that I'm driving the, the family minivan now, what the boys call the swagger wagon. And it is a old, 10 years old, uh, been stained in multiple ways, if you can imagine that. And you pull up in this thing and it squeaks and it squawks and it whines and it rumbles and it rattle, rattles. And, and, and you know, I'm just, I, I, I want something that demonstrates that I am still a man, right? I, I want something that demonstrates that I, I've still got it together. I mean, my first car was a 71 Dodge Dart that my dad and I completely remade. We, we jacked it up. We put headers on it and dual pipes. We put racing stripes on it, put a hood scoop on it. I mean, that thing would run and it sounded awesome. And then I had a Trans Am in college and man, you talk about a fast car. That was awesome. And now I'm driving a minivan, right? And, and I, I just... I want to feel cool. I want to feel manly. And so I think I succumbed to that pressure. I don't know if it was right or not, but I bought a truck. And, uh, you know, a nice F-150 four-door, four-wheel drive truck to kind of compensate for the way that that made me feel. Do do you want to see my truck? Let me show you the truck. I I got to show you the truck. Isn't she a beauty? I mean, really... This, this truck is marvelous. I mean, now I can feel like a man, right? N- now I can have the experience of doing donuts in the snow, right? No. You're, you're all looking at me like I've lost my mind, right? Why? Because a model like this can never give me the experience that the real thing can. When you look to a model to give you the experience that the real truck would give you, you're going to end up being frustrated. You're going to be, end up being let down. And I wonder how many times that we as Christians don't feel 
saved. We don't feel the joy. We don't feel the peace. We don't feel the confidence, the assurance that we want so desperately to feel as Christians. And instead of going to the actual truck, instead of going to Christ himself, we go to the model. We go to the copy. We go to the shadow of Christ in our life. And thus, we don't get the experience. We don't have the sensation of comfort. We don't sense that the struggle is gone. We still struggle with doubt and we still struggle with that spiritual depression. You see, the author of Hebrews is writing to these individuals and he's coming to this point in the letter. He's he's really been hammering this idea that Jesus is our high priest and you cannot go back to the Old Testament sacrifices. You can't go back to that because those sacrifices are simply a model of what Christ has come to do. You see, a model is there to show you what the real is like. It's not the real thing, but it shows you what the real thing looks like on a more miniature scale. Now, this truck, it doesn't have an engine, so it can't drive on its own. It's not big enough to transport person from point A to point B. It just can't do those things. But what it can do is show you what a truck looks like and give you a desire for the real thing. You see, the Old Testament sacrifices were a copy, were a model of the coming of Christ And they didn't actually take away sins. And they didn't actually make you atoned and and make you right with God. They simply gave you a picture of what Jesus was going to do when he came so that we would be right with God. But these people were tempted to look back at the model and put their confidence in the model to give them the joy and the comfort and the assurance and the confidence that they were right with God. And I don't think that many of us in this room probably are tempted to become Jews, as I said a couple of weeks ago, but I do think that many times we do the same thing. You see, we struggle with that, don't we? We struggle with confidence. We struggle with assurance. We struggle with fear. We struggle with a lack of joy in our Christianity. And our Christianity just seems kind of to, to fall flat. And, and we, we look around and there are other Christians that seem to have joy and they seem to have it together. And, and when we come in here and we sing songs, they're just not coming from the heart. You, just, you can't even muster enough strength to really even sing the song right. And you just don't feel saved and you want desperately to feel saved. And so what do you do? You think, well, I just need to go to church more. Oh, I just need to buckle down and really read my Bible this year. I, I, need, to, I need to have a daily quiet time. I mean, that's what they, they drilled into my head as a teenager. I need to have a daily quiet time or I'm not going to know God. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a quiet time. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with coming to church. I want you to come to church. The, the point is that we oftentimes are looking at these things things to give us the joy that can only come by knowing Christ. You say, Phil, I'm I'm not quite sure. I'm following you. It feels like you're splitting hairs. I know, but I feel like we have to in this point because this is a, a terrible, terrible danger that all of us, myself included, fall into. When we struggle with assurance and we struggle with doubt and we struggle with a, a lack of feeling saved and feeling joy and peace and contentment in Christ, we try and conjure up those feelings by doing more. I mean, when we say things like, well, you know, i got to go to church this week and get my spiritual battery recharged. Why do we say that? It's because we have this, this idea that I... I, I've, I've, it's almost like an iPhone. You've got to plug it in every night, get it charged up so it can last through the next day. And we feel like we've got to come in and plug into the spiritual outlet of church in order to, to get, to get uh, energized up for the week that comes because the week just drains all the spirituality out of us. But that's, 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 that's living life so miserably. Because you're looking at this physical activity to give you joy that will last and it doesn't last you need to know Christ so that it's as if you're permanently plugged into him you don't have to be recharged because you're always charged with him you see that's what he wants us to focus on let's look at the text and I I want you to just 
hang with me through these six verses to see this distinction that he makes. And I hope that it will encourage you. He says in verse 1, now the main point in what has been said is this. Now, th- th- this is the main point. You know, I've been talking to you for seven chapters now, and I want you to, to, just, to just stop for a moment and understand this is the main point. This is the main idea. This is what I'm trying to get across to you. He says, we have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. Jesus actually removes our sin. So the point is, rely on him and not on your religious activity to experience peace and joy. We have an actual high priest who has made actual atonement for sins in the actual presence of God. That's huge. These people were tempted to go back to a priesthood that was a copy of the real priest, who is Jesus, in a copy of the true tabernacle, the true dwelling place of God, which is in heaven itself, to make a copy of sacrifice which Jesus is the real sacrifice and what the author is saying is Jesus actually made atonement for you 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 don't need to do anything else to secure God's love for you to secure God's favor of you to secure God's acceptance of you you are loved and you are accepted from this point forever no matter what you do because Jesus died for you that's what he's trying to get across to us when he says Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty. He has taken his seat. It's, he's echoing what he said in 1 verse 3. Chapter 1 verse 3 says, When he had made purification of sins, he what? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What we have to remember is that Jesus has accomplished our redemption. He did not just make salvation possible. He saved us. When it says he sat down, it means there's no more priestly work in regard to atonement that needs to be done. It's done. It's paid in full. It's finished. I mean, that's the whole point. When we get to chapters 9 and 10, we're going to talk about this a lot more. But just just let me read you a couple of verses from this chapter. He says in verse 24... Actually, no, chapter 9, verse 11, it says, But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. So he's not going into a man-made tabernacle that's just a copy or a model of the real thing. He's going into the actual presence of God in heaven itself. And not through the blood of goats and calves. He's not going through the model of animal blood. He's going through the actual atoning blood of his own life of his own humanity through his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption he did it one time he went in one time with blood his own blood and sprinkled it before the very presence of God himself and God accepted that sacrifice as is proven in Christ's resurrection and now All of those for whom Christ died are eternally redeemed. He has paid for their sins. He has made purification for their sins. In verse 24, he says the same thing. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but what? Into heaven itself. And now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to do what? To put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus came and put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What I'm saying is that all of our sin past, present, and future that you haven't even committed yet has been paid for. Every sin 
has been paid for. We have a tendency when we commit a sin to think, God is frustrated with me. I've got to prove to God that I'm serious about this Christianity. I've got to show God that I'm really sorry. And so I've got to, I, I, I've got to do something nice for somebody to make up for the, the nasty way that I spoke to my wife this morning. I've got, to, I've got to make some real sacrifices in my life because I looked at pornography this week. I, I, I've, got to, I've got to do something to show God I'm serious. But that's a false gospel. It's a false hope. It's looking at the model. It's thinking that I have got to do something in my life to prove to God that I still love Him. That's not the point. God loves you. And God saved you. And God paid for all your sins in the sacrifice of Christ so that your sins, your viewing of pornography, your gossip and slander, your outbursts of anger at your children, your, your, your lying tongue, your, your, your lustful thoughts, your, your whatever your sin is that you're struggling with, Jesus paid for that. He paid for homosexual acts. He paid for secret abortions. He paid for all your sins. When He died on the cross, there's no sin that's too big for Jesus to pay for. And if you're trusting in Him to pay for your sins, know without a doubt that you are secure, you are loved, you are accepted, you are adopted by God, and He will never turn His back on you. When you struggle and you wonder god can you really accept me can you do you really love me are you you need to remind yourself of this fact jesus sits at the right hand of the majesty in heaven because he's already paid for the sin you're worried about he's not standing there having to make a new sacrifice he doesn't bring his blood again every time you sin All of it is paid for. You see, the rub is this. We want to feel saved. We want to feel peace. We want to feel joy. We want to experience this continuous feeling of assurance. But rather than feasting our hungry souls upon the truth of Jesus' great sacrifice, we try and conjure up those feelings with a lot of extra religious activity and devotion. You see, our confidence is not resting in Christ accomplished work our confidence is resting in our activity I know I know I must be saved because I shared the gospel with somebody last week I know I know I must be saved because I've really been doing good on my Bible reading this year and, and I wouldn't be reading my Bible if I wasn't saved right I know I must be saved because you know I was I was nice to that person that's so mean to me at work do you do that do you look at the results of Christ's work in your life as the grounds of your confidence? Or do you look at Christ and say, I'm saved because He died for all my sins? See, we want the joy, but we keep looking at the model instead of the real thing. It's like, it's like you want to experience the beach. You, you, you want to go to the beach. You want to feel the, the salt breeze on, on your face and taste it on your tongue. You, you want the sun to bake your skin. You, you want to feel the cold slap of water on your ankles. You want to feel the sand between your toes. And because you want the experience of the beach, what do you do? Well, you go to the local... Walmart and you go to their postcard section and you find a bunch of really pretty pictures of the beach and you look at those postcards and you think wow this is awesome I'm at the beach no you go to the beach right because you know looking at a picture all that that does is make you want to be there doesn't it? I mean, that's why all those travel agencies have those beautiful pictures of the beach and the blue water. Why? Because when we see that and we live with this outside, we want to go. We want to be there. The picture 
all the picture does is give you the desire to actually go there because you know that the picture doesn't give you the experience. It simply whets your appetite for the experience of the real. The religious activities that we, we come to church not because we, we believe that by coming to church that God accepts us. We come to church in order to know God more deeply, to, to hear His Word explained so that our love of Him is enriched. You see, the, 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 the religious activity, whether it's coming to church or reading your Bible or praying or having your devotions or whatever, we don't do those things in order to be accepted by God. We do those things to whet our appetite for God more. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like looking at the picture. Jesus, Jesus made actual atonement for sin. And he made this actual atonement for sin in the actual presence of God. I mean, he makes this huge point in chapter 8. Look at verses 3 and following. He says, For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Hence it is necessary this high priest also have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses also warned by God, was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. The tabernacle on earth was a copy of the real in heaven. That's why in Exodus 25 verse 40, God tells Moses, make sure that you you make this tabernacle just like the pattern I showed you. Because it's reflecting of something else. It's a copy of something else. Now a copy, a copy is useful in the sense that it gives you a picture of what the real is like, but it doesn't accomplish the real. Let's, for instance, several of you are going to India in just a few weeks, and you had to get a passport for that. And part of getting your passport, you had to get your birth certificate, didn't you? And take your birth certificate in. Well, you can't just take a copy of your birth certificate in, can you? Because they won't accept that. You have to have the real birth certificate. You have to have the one with the seal on it. You have to have the one with the little bumps on the paper. You, you have to have the real, authentic birth certificate to accomplish the task of getting your passport. Because a copy, while it gives the relevant information, doesn't have the authority to accomplish the, fa the act. The Old Testament sacrifices were a copy of the, of the real sacrifice of Christ. They showed what was necessary for sinners to come into the presence of a holy God. Death of a substitute. But they didn't actually accomplish that. He goes on to say in Hebrews 9 and 10 that the, de the, the blood of animals, the gavs and coats and all that stuff doesn't take away sin. It doesn't accomplish it. It's just a copy. It's just a picture but because it's not the authentic, it's not the authentic, infinite, holy Son of God, it doesn't accomplish redemption. It's just a copy. It's like, it's like, uh, have you ever been to one of those civil, civil war reenactments? Where you go and, and you have this battlefield and they reenact the actual battle that took place in the civil war. And you can hear the guns thundering and you can smell the acrid scents of gunpowder and you see men screaming and falling to the ground and, and you're watching this battle unfold. And then what happens when it's over? They all get up. Because they're not really dead. Did that, the battle you just witnessed, did it affect the outcome of the war? No, because it's a reenactment to show what actually happened. The Old Testament sacrifices are a reenactment prior to the fact. They're showing what happened, but they're not actually accomplishing redemption. It's Jesus that accomplishes redemption. And what the author is saying is, guys, you can't go back to the reenactment because it doesn't do anything for you. But we're not in danger of going back to the reenactment, are we? We're in danger of, I think, of, the sh of looking at the shadow. You see, he goes on to say here, who serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. What is a shadow? A shadow is cast, and you see the outline and the shape of the object that casts the shadow. 
You see, when Christ comes into our life, He transforms our life. He changes the way we think. He changes the way we believe. He changes the way we behave. He changes our life. In fact, He's doing this work gradually. I mean, He's, he's changing us every day. And every day we look more and more like Christ. And part of that change is we have different desires, we have different commitments, we have different affections. Those are the shadows. That, that, those are the, the results of Christ's work in our life. But you know what we do a lot of times? When we struggle with doubt and we struggle with fear and we struggle with a lack of assurance, what we do is we look at the shadow and think, I must be saved because, look, 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 there's, there is, there is, uh, I, I love people and I didn't love these kind of people before or I shared the gospel with somebody and I, I surely wouldn't have done that before or I, I read my Bible more diligently and I wouldn't have done that before. Now, these things are still good things because they're an effect of Christ in your life. But the problem is you're looking at the shadow to gain confidence that you're accepted by God rather than looking at Christ and knowing I'm accepted by God because of Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? This is a big danger for us as Christians. Don't confuse the result of Christ's work in your life with the work of Christ. And what I mean by that is don't confuse that God accepts you because you do these things. Because you read your Bible, because you attend church regularly, because you pray devotedly, because you share the gospel, because you serve in a ministry voluntarily. Don't confuse the fact that I'm right with God because of these things. No! Those things are true in your life because Christ has saved you. You are right with God because of Christ's finished, accomplished work in the actual presence of God. So the question is, what are you looking to? When you don't feel saved, when you don't feel confident, when you don't feel secure, when you don't feel the joy, when you don't feel the peace, what do you do? If you just try and do more religious activity, you're not ever going to have joy. Because you're looking at a shadow and you're not looking at Christ. If I were really going through a midlife crisis, which I'm not, and I really wanted to feel cool, which I could care less about, I wouldn't go buy a model and think that that would satisfy. I would, I would get the real thing. If you hunger for joy and peace and confidence and assurance, don't look at your religious activity to give you that. It may be well and good. It may be things that God has commanded, but you are not saved because you do those things. Thus, you are not going to have confidence because you do those things. You must remind yourself of the gospel, which is why the gospel is not just for lost people. The gospel is something that we as Christians need to love and think through and remind ourselves of and preach to ourselves again and again and again and again because we are woefully tempted to trust in our activity to make us right with God when, when God has already accepted us in Christ. So evaluate your Christianity. Are you looking at the postcards of the beach or are you at the beach are you, are, you, are you looking to Jesus? Or are you looking at Jesus' shadow in your life to give you confidence? When you're doubting whether you're saved, do you go through a checklist of your religious activity and think, I must be saved because I do this, this, and this? Or do you tell yourself, I'm struggling with fear here. I'm going to go back and I'm going to remember Jesus said, but all who believe in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus made purification for all my sins. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. When you, when you struggle with doubt, don't go to the shadows. Run to the real. Run to Jesus.
and remind yourself of the gospel. Trust in him. Don't be a miserable Christian. Have joy. Let's pray.